because sometimes there could be a way of life and we have to learn to live with pain like a lot of older people do. But we're going to learn to live, to, to live in peace and quietness and tranquility and be grateful and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. I know that my state of being is not of me, but it's of God. Praise the Lord. And, and also we all notice that uh, Lisa's not here. You know, Lisa, uh, very, very few uh, church type days that she's not here. And the reason being is that uh, her, her father is in the hospital dying. And uh, he's my age. And I don't really know what he's dying of. Pretty, I think perhaps he's having a lot of heart problems and uh, things like that. And, uh, uh, and she called me and, and uh, I asked her, uh, what would you like me to pray? So she, she was silent and I said, would you like me to pray for your father to pull through? They gave him 72 hours yesterday. And he says, just because of God's mercy and God's love, uh, I, I would like my father to pull through this. And I said, well, praise God. So we're going to take a little time to make a prayer. And <clears throat> I'll get you notice for a couple of Sundays. My brother hasn't been here. That's because he had an operation. And he's in the hospital now. So I'd like to pray for him, pray for Lisa. If there's any prayer, we don't want to get a flood of prayers. They're just some things that are that we, we really we really want that, that they uh, uh, overbearing, burdensome things that we'd like to get rid of. Uh, praise the Lord. Is anybody like a they like to put a petition for prayer while we pray for Lisa and Gilbert? Pardon? Okay, praise God. Anybody else? Praise the Lord. We're going to be praying for Sister Stewart's father, Lisa's father, and for Gilbert. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise. Father, uh, I know how much... Uh, The Father means to Lisa and to Sister Stewart, Father. We all know how much it means and how much burden and how much hurt we have when some of us, Father, uh, are in sickness and in pain. And Father, uh, we want to put this petition before you, Father, that you will heal Lisa's father, Father, and Sister Stewart. They both are sick. I don't know if both are in the hospital, Father, but I know that Lisa's daddy is in the hospital and he's only got 72 hours now, maybe 10 or 12 hours. Or maybe a couple of days. But Father, uh, he's still not in extreme old age and I would like you to reach out, Father, with your healing hand, your your Holy Spirit, Father, and touch Lisa's father, Father, in the name of Jesus. Touch his heart, Father. Touch his body. Father, as we get old and there are the pains that are there, and heal all these things, Father. And get him out of that sick bed, my Father, in the name of Jesus. Give him a few more years of life, Father. I know that Lisa would appreciate it if you give him a few more years of life, Father. And I know that Sister Stewart also would appreciate if you give her father a full, few more years of life on this earth. If all, even though we know that life eternal is the thing we desire the most, yet all in all, Father, we ask that you would touch them and heal them and raise them by your mighty power, Father. Because of your love and kindness and because of your mercy, Father, and because it means something to us, for those that we love, not to be hurting, Father, and, bo and burdened, my Father. Touch their fathers, Father, and extend their lifetime, my Father. 
to a few more years, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, I put this, and, and we've, I've fallen your mercy and your love to extend them, Father, their life, just a little bit longer. A few years longer, Father. And I also, Father, uh, pray uh, for Gilbert. Uh, we know that uh, he'd been coming to this church, Father, and, and uh, I believe that he falls under the under our care to, to pray for him, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, that from heaven, Father, your Holy Spirit could just reach in him, Father, and touch that, uh, that, uh, that leaking part that used to go into his uh, gallbladder, and seal it tight in the name of Jesus. That that bile did not get, back, get into his body, Father, that poisons the body in the name of Jesus. That it be sealed tight, Father, in the name of Jesus. And whether, whether he will never know or his family, Father, why he was healed in this manner, let it be known that we know and we, and we thank you, Father, and say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Because if we know that it is your hand. We know it, even though they may never know it. And Father, if I give them the opportunity, I will tell them why he was healed. In the glorious name of Jesus, Father, we ask and we pray all these things in the glorious name of Jesus, Father. In the mighty name of our, our Lord, who died that we might live. In his Wonderful name that washed us in his blood, Father, that our sins may be raised from our lives. Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we ask and we pray these prayers, Father, in the name of Jesus. And all those that agree say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's have a prayer and to go into the Word. Heavenly Father, uh, we opened his service, Father, and I hope that it was open even when I first stepped up here, Father. But I just want to say that we want to put this service in your hands, Father, from the beginning to the end. And that you might touch every single one of us, my Father, that are here. Father, you touch our burdens, Father, and our sickness that be removed away from us in the name of Jesus, Father. All these sickness, whatever they may be, Father, let them be removed in the name of Jesus. And any burden that anyone would have, Father. And that you would bless, Father, everyone that is here in a special way, Father. And that, uh, Father, that you would help me, Father, in the name of Jesus, that through your Holy Spirit, this body may be able to speak and to bring this word to touch us and to heal us, my Father, in the name of Jesus. And that your word would come with power and anointing and cause us to understand and to be blessed and washed by your word. In the glorious name of Jesus, we put this service in your hands, Father. And we ask, Father, that we might have your grace here with us, Father, and, and your angels, Father, and your presence, my Father, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit would just be among us here, Father, in the name of Jesus. And we give you the honor, Father, and the glory and the praise that rightfully belongs to you, my Father. Receive, Father, the praise and the glory from our lips, Father, to you. Receive it, my Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask and I pray this prayer in the glorious name of Jesus, Father. And all those that agree say amen. amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. You know, as we uh, look at the Word of God, um, uh, I have met a lot of people that, and I believe the biggest percentage of Christianity, they say that they know this Word. Look what it says here, yes, I know. Look at this Word, uh, yeah, I know that. But we... 
I happen to know that in Christianity, there's a lot of people that are in a fallen state. Because we can see that, that their main objective in Christian a Christian life is money. It is adultery and fornication. It is lying and thieving. We know this in many churches. And uh, they think that uh, not only is that they're going to go up with God, regardless of whatever they're doing at the time, whatever it is that they're doing, they believe that uh, they're going to say, oh, Lord Jesus is just coming and, and uh, it's time for us, it's time for me to go because there's so much word that tells you that, that whatever you do, it's covered under the blood. But, but this horrendous thing is that's okay. It's covered under the blood. There's many things that they say that once you're saved, you're always saved. I don't care if you, now you turn to do s Satan worship because you made a pact with God, it can never be broken. There's a lot of these words that's convinced a lot of people uh, to live in this manner. Uh, in, the, in the book of Revelation, there's a word when he says, that he says, come out from among them, my people. Meaning that there's a lot of Christians that God has called that are in the wrong places. And at the end time, God's going to tell them to come out from among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord. Come out from among them. There are people that are in the church. There are people that are worshiping God and they're hearing preaching. And God is going to tell them to come out from among them. And, uh, and I believe that most of these people that are out there, they say they know the Word of God and they know all that is happening. But the Word of God says that they will not know. And what is that they will not know? They will never know when the time, time comes and it's approaching the coming of the Lord Jesus. It's, it, is a, it is a time of His coming that it's sealed and that there is no human on this earth that knows when he's coming. This is the reason that the Bible urges us that we may live a good Christian life so that if we are removed from this earth before he comes, that we can be assured that we're going to go with him. But even though that we are alive, the word of God shows us very plain that a lot of us that are Christians is not going to know when the time of God's coming is drawing near. Uh, they're not going to know. Uh, how is it? How ridiculous is Christianity going to think about the coming of Christ? It is going to be as ridiculous as when, uh, when the, the preachings before the flood The man that was told to build this ark, the people were laughing at him. What are you building? This is the salvation when the destruction comes. What is this destruction? This is when the water, the rain starts falling from above. They would laugh at him because at that particular time, even though they couldn't see the cloud, they couldn't see the stars. Because there was a water that God had divided in the beginning was covering the earth in the stratosphere. And it was, and they say, oh, they, they never knew that, that this, what they saw, that they couldn't see, but this, this sky was actually water. They didn't know that. And he was telling that God revealed to him that those that were not prepared this water would come down and it's going to destroy every, every human that was on the entire earth unless he was in the ark. They, they laughed because they didn't know what rain was. At that particular time, it, it was created so the, the water that was on the earth, it would raise up like a fog, but in a heavier way. And all this fog, this heavy fog, the, it would be like dew today. You can take dew and, and leave a, a, a cloth outside and you go in there in the morning, you pick it up and that, that rack would be soaking wet with the dew. It was something like that, but heavier. And uh, 
all these heaviness that would rise up in this mist, this is the way that everything was watered. The trees, uh, the, the, all that you planted, the, 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 all that was the harvests, all these things. So in a way, it was a better way because this would, hap this would happen every day. So everything that you planted was well watered on a continuous basis because you didn't have to wait on something random as rain. Was it going to rain or not rain or, or a drought or whatever? It would, this mist would come out and water the earth every single day. They would laugh. They, they didn't know what it was to plant something and to, and, and to wait to hope that the winds or somehow per chance that they would get the waters at the proper and right time. So they, they laugh. Is it rain? But we don't need no rain. What is rain? Well, it's like for the waters of the planet, but it's going to come from above. <laughs> this guy's crazy. The coming of the Lord Jesus, when the time is drawing near, and people is going to be preaching about, drawing the, about the drawing near of God returning to this earth, it's going to seem like a bad joke to Christianity. Believe it or not. It's just going to seem like a joke. And I believe that that even now there's people that are on television saying that, that the time is drawing near. I believe the whole world's in agreement that the time is drawing near. And certainly that I would like to say that we're nearer than what we were 2,000 years ago. Praise God. But to be able to know that his, draw, that his coming is near and for you to to, to, to tremble and to pray is, oh, Lord Jesus, I know you're coming. And uh, just strengthen me, Father, that I may be uh, something that is delightful to your eyes and that I may be caught up into the clouds above and be part of your kingdom in a very serious manner. Uh, today, we haven't got down to that, to that kind of prayer yet. Lord Jesus, don't forget about this simple person that you called and your son died that I may live. Don't forget about me. We haven't got to that place yet. And, and the most of Christianity, uh, when you go, uh, when you see this type of Christianity that I, I used to see because we were kind of associated with some of them through the course of time that I had been here at Unity of Faith and, and, uh, and the time that I have met them, they're always smiling and happy. Hey, man, glory to God, hallelujah. And, uh, and I asked him, how do you feel if I felt any better our rapture? They mean that, that, that they were so holy and so sanctified that uh, at any given moment when they're ready, when God came. And, but many of them, as I talked to them, I told them, I says, but how can God, how can you be ready with your fornication? And they go, uh, and tears will roll down their faces. And your adultery. But they don't take it as serious. They are they're on a pretending on a pretending stage. They want to pretend one to another that one is holier than the other. And I remember a, a brother that uh, uh, he uh, he had a girlfriend and he, he said he didn't have nothing to eat and and so you want to know if I provide? I said sure I will. And uh, I had an opportunity to talk to him. I said, listen, uh, uh, I, was, I was trying to get him in a position for me to tell him about, about the seriousness of being a Christian. And he was telling me, yeah, he said, you know, I, I, would, I would fast for two or three days. And, and then uh, when I would go to church and I'd, and I'd shake uh, some of my brother's hand, they'd go, wow! He, he says, man, this is where you been? And, and they do it, if they do it, they do it for the effect. That man, oh man, I just, that, 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 that 220 just went out my arm. And, and, and that, that just about, but, but he had a girlfriend and, and he left his home to live with his girlfriend. And he's an old, he's an old man. And uh, I finally told him, you know, how do you expect to go with God if you're living in an improper manner? I'm not saying that it's wrong for you to have a girlfriend. I'm saying that it's wrong for you not to be married and have a girlfriend and 
uh, and, and go to the functions with your wife that you should, but you should not be doing that outside of the scope of marriage. But uh, after, that, after that talk and everything, uh, I haven't seen him since. That was a few years ago. Praise God. And uh, so uh, it is a very serious matter. We're going to be touching that part today in the Word. That indeed, that if we are in a, in a playing stage with God, when the time is drawing near, we're not going to know. We're going to be smiling and being happy. Hallelujah. Amen. Everything is fine. Thank you, Jesus. And it's going to be a pretending because if you're not living right for God, there is the only thing you can do to let the other people that you are, are going to go with God and, and you're as dedicated as they are is to pretend. Uh, we can pretend that we are dedicated. We, we can pretend that we are serving God properly and right. We can pretend. Uh, that is a very, don't you, don't you think it's a very foolish thing to do? To pretend that you're going to go with God? To pretend you're dedicated? Because that isn't going to do you any good. And what are we trying to prove to the, to the person that sit, sits next to us? We're trying to convince them that we're holy? For, for what reason? It, 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 but that's the way it's going to be. Praise the Lord. Uh, I would like everybody to turn to, uh, well, we're gonna, I would want to go to, uh, to, the, to Matthew. Uh, let me see what we're at. Uh, 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 Matthew 24, 36. That we make sure that, that we don't get caught by the spirit of pretension. Pretending that we're ready, pretending that, that we're holy, pretending. C humanity is very good as pretending. And uh, I heard a man that was trying to say the same thing, and, and what he was saying was, let's take the mask off. Now, let's take the mask off, and, and let's show ourselves for what we really are. Let's take the mask off. No, don't put that mask of pretension in the front of Christianity. And hallelujah, amen. And I believe that a lot of us, we, we're very good pretenders of Christianity. It is this, it is this, if we think that we can pretend and we're satisfying humans to think that we are holy, that's a very serious thing. That means that you're so foolish as to think that if you pretend that it's worthwhile, even if you're not dedicated, for some people to think you're dedicated and to, for them to think you're going to go to heaven, but all the time it never ends in your mind, you ain't going anywhere. That's what pretending does. In the book of Matthew 24, verse 36, it says, in verse 36, 36 of Matthew 24, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. There is no human being that knows when he is going to return. The reason for that is because those that are pretending they're going to go, they will never know. They're going to pretend up to that last day the same way that those were in the time of Noah. They would laugh at the preacher because the time of destruction was drawing near. And it caused him to live a long time because of the time uh, that, another, that another holy man would die. It was a signal that it was the end of the world. They could care less whether there was even, even a sign. But the signs are only for those that love God. Those signs, we're going to know them. You're going to know them, you that love God. And they remove this pretending thing and thinking that it's a, a beautiful thing to hide under a cloak of pretension. 
and thinking that it satisfies you deep inside that you are fooling some Christian in making believe that you're somebody holy, which is not going to help you, which is, which is the devil fooling you. He says, go ahead and pretend. And uh, you're going to reap all the benefits of a dedicated person. That's not true. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not, not the angels of heaven. Not even the angels know. He says, but my Father only, the Lord Jesus. You see this red ink? It means that Jesus was talking. He said that there's no one, no one knows, not even him. Only his Father knows when that day would be. But as the, as the days of Noah were, as the days of Noah, this is what we were talking about. What was in the times of Noah? So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It means the same state, the same, the same things that happened, that, the, that are happening today, they're going, they happen already at the time of Noah. The pretending and uh, playing around with God and... and uh, uh, procrastinating, uh, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to, I'm going to, next, next year I'm going to really get down. I'm going to dedicate my life to God. Well, now, uh, th next year, and then in two years, I'm really going to get right down, and I'm going to, I'm going to hunker down, and I'm going to really going to serve God. You just always in such a distance up ahead, you can't reach it. Because a lot of people, if they were new when he was coming, I, maybe that some fear would come on them to try to dedicate their lives. But God is not going to give them the luxury to know. It's a fantastic thing. That even though we're in the, hospital, in the church and we're pretending, we're not going to know. Even though at that time when I preach about the coming of Jesus and to prepare yourself, there are a lot of us that we don't make no effort to prepare ourselves. It's just like a, you know, so far, will of the wisp. Who knows? He says, for the days that were before the flood, they were eating and smiling and laughing to one another, having a fellowship in the dinner table, and they were drinking, and they were and their their interest of finding a of finding a wife, a uh, 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 marrying and giving in marriage. Until the very day that Noah entered into the ark, they still didn't know. And knew not until the flood came. And took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Jesus returns, it's going to be the same way and the same thing. Look at chapter twenty, at uh, chapter twenty-five, verse one. He says, "Then shall the kingdom of God, to the, the kingdom of heaven, be likened unto ten virgins." Listen well carefully, because he's trying to give you an inside unto his coming. What these ten virgins means is that. A virgin, when he's going to get married, uh, he has a white, white raiment. Because she knows she's going to be married, the white raiment is already there. What it means is that this person was washed in the blood of Jesus. Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. In other words, in order to be able to see when the Lord Jesus is coming, you're going to have to have a lamp. And that lamp is going to be the Holy Spirit. This is what the light symbolizes. This is what the oil that, that, that sets the maturity going into this, into this light. It is, by, it is by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit, those that are holy, they're going to know. They're not going to know the day nor the hour. But the Bible says they will know the season. You know what a season is? A season is 90 days long. 90 days and 90 days, and 90 days, and at the last quarter, of the last fourth of the 90 days is a whole year. The season is within 90 days. The church 
is going to tell the people, just like I'm telling you now, be prepared. But at that time, they're going to say, because his coming is imminent. To those that are not prepared, they're going to sound like it always have pre preached. He's always preaching that manner. He's always preaching that way. Even President said, I've been here for 20 years. Jesus is coming. Now he's saying he's imminent. It ain't no different than when he says he was coming. It's going to seem like foolish to many Christians' ears. But those that are, are full of the Holy Ghost, their ears are going to go up. And there's going to be an assurance inside. It is imminent, the coming of the Lord. It is imminent. But it's only a special thing that God's going to put in every one of us hearts. The pretending ain't going to do you no good. Even if you went to church for 50 years, it ain't going to matter to God. Five of these were, were wise. The other half were foolish. There is wise people in the church, and there are foolish people in the church. This is what he's trying to say. And, uh, and they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. They never went out to find out for the Holy Spirit to work with them. It is the Holy Spirit that gives you the discernment of the, of the season when God returns. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. means that the Holy Spirit was guiding their lives. And they were in tune with God through the Holy Ghost. The light, the light, the, the, the Holy Spirit is the oil. The light is being guided by the Holy Spirit. So that you will be able to see when God, the Lord Jesus, is coming. Only when you are well prepared under this will you be able to recognize the coming of the Lord Jesus. While the bridegroom tarrieth, he's, he's not, is he, being delayed. They all slumbered and they slept. And at midnight, that means it's going to be like nighttime when God returns. We know that it's, I would say, what, what, would I, what would I feel in my heart if you ask me? What does David feel? What is going to be the time when he returns? I don't know the hour, but it's going to be high noon, 12 o'clock, when Jesus returns. But the only that high noon is going to turn into night. What do I believe that? I believe that Jesus died on the cross, was hung on the cross precisely at 12 o'clock. It is telling you here, midnight. It's telling you. He returns at midnight. But we know that he cannot come at midnight because it's going to be day when he turns into night. So then I would say 12 o'clock, like midnight, at the middle of the day. All that it means in the midnight is in the middle of the night. 12 o'clock is the middle of the night where the, day, the night is divided. The, the 12 o'clock high noon is the division of the day. And if the sun is going to get darkened, it's going to get darkened and it's dividing the time. It has to be 12 o'clock noon. He says, and at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him, but it's going to be pitch dark outside. There ain't going to be no sun that gives a the light. There ain't going to be no moon. There ain't going to be no stars. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Otherwise, they can't, they can't meet the Lord Jesus. See, this is only symbolic. Because every eye shall behold him. And what it means that being guided to the Holy Spirit is what's going to be able to make you to rise up and to meet Jesus on the clouds. If you don't, if you don't, the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to make you to get caught up to Christ. If you're not going to be full of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that can lift you up. Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. I mean, they lit them up. And the foolish said unto the wise, what it was when this, those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, they knew that the coming of, of the Lord was true. But the other ones didn't know for sure because they couldn't see and they were not guided by the Holy Spirit. And the foolish said unto the wise, We can't see. Give us some of your oil. For our lamps are going out. We have no discernment. 
and we can't see where we're going. And the wise answered, saying, not so. He says, let Leslie be not enough for us and you. But go ye, you always went for somebody else to pray for you. You always went for somebody to seek the Holy Spirit for you. You always went for somebody to seek God for you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. But you can't buy this. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him unto the marriage. When the Lord Jesus comes, he's going to come for his bride. You remember in the book of Revelations, the very first, ver last verses of the book of Revelations, he said, he said, come, Lord Jesus. And the bride says, come, Lord Jesus. The bride is going to be saying, come, Lord Jesus. And why would the bride say, come, Lord Jesus? Because he has not provided a beautiful life here. Because at that time, at the coming of the Lord Jesus, the greatest tribulation that is on, going to be on the earth, since never has happened, even from the beginning of time, on the Holocaust, when they, when they cooked uh, alive six million Jews, it cannot even be compared. Well, when, the, when all these people that we see in the Word of God, when a, a hundred thousand of the enemy that came to fight against Jerusalem, when he sent out, his, when he sent out the choir to sing choir of uh, 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 praises to God, down below from that, from that big cliff, down below was the camp of the enemy. He said, look, sending the singers out. In the morning, they were all dead. Every single one. There are going to be so many things. They're going to be so foolish. It's going to seem so foolish. But it's not going to seem like nothing. We're going to say, come Lord Jesus. Because of tremendous upheaval. And the darkness. And the, and the hideous things that are going to be happening. At that particular time. This is what's going to cause. The bride to say, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. The, in the last 30 months, to, uh, 30, 90 days, 3 months, they're going to know that the coming is imminent. And all these 3 months is going to be nothing but prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And the bride says, come, Lord Jesus. And then says the writer, says the one that wrote the book, nevertheless, he says, come, Lord Jesus. Even did he knew that he was a long ways away. He said, come, Lord Jesus. We're going to have to be in a high state of spirituality to be able to really understand what it is to love God and to say, come, Lord Jesus. But give a to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins. They were, well, you know, virgins mean that they were clean, and they were washed in the blood. The other virgins, uh, other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answer, he's going to answer them and say, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. That means you never knew Jesus on a first, on a first, on a face-to-face -face basis. You never had a relationship with him. You never talked to him. This is what it means to be saturated with his oil. It means the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Being in contact with God. And at the end of these 90 days, you're going to feel, I feel that his coming is imminent. It's going to be on everybody that loves God. His coming is imminent. I don't, I don't hear no words, but I know within my heart that his coming is imminent. And the preachers are going to be pre preaching. The coming of the Lord Jesus is imminent. To a lot of us, it is even if he did never came in another two years or five or ten or fifteen or whatever years. 
the same basis of going into the kingdom of God still holds. You need to be devoted, you need to be holy in order to make it into the kingdom of God. If you die before he comes, you also need to be prepared. Right here in these verses, if you just go up a little bit, you will see that even if that we do die, we need to be prepared. Look what he says in verse 13. He's telling it to us. Watch, therefore, for you know, you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. It's a warning. Watch, therefore, be prepared. Be, be at your most highest state of spirituality. Watch. Who, who was the watch? If we look on to the, earth, the Old Testament, because this is based on the Old Testament, the Old Testament, every city had a tower. The tower was the last one to be taken on any city. Why do you think they made a tower? He was the first one that gave the cry, the enemy is coming. He was always the one that was in the position to know when the enemy was approaching. He was on this tower. And you could see perhaps a couple miles away, maybe three. And when you see this, all that smoke of, of, of dust coming up out of the, uh, the hooves of the horses, he would blow the trumpet. He was the watcher. He was not only watching from the road that approaches the city, but he's always looking for the back and look, those were the watchers. This is what he's been here, it means here. He says, watch, therefore, you are the watcher. You need to watch out for yourself for the enemy not to infiltrate you. You need to watch to remain to remain so close to God that that if, that if it comes like the, a lot of the people that were in the old here in this New Testament, the, like let's take Paul. He said, uh, "I know that my time draweth near." He knew he was going to die. My time has come. He says, there now is waiting for me a crown of righteousness. He knew he was going to die. Who, who revealed that to him? The Holy Spirit. And he was ready. He was the same thing. He was watching. He knew when he would go. And it really didn't matter. It is also the watcher that watches. So the enemy cannot come and devour the city. The watchers are there for a purpose. Why do you think they always get mad at Brother Earl and me? Because we are the ones that are watching. And we have to approach these people and say, listen, be careful what you're doing. Be careful. And so you may not, you may not feel the hate and the, and, and, uh, and the hate that is directed towards us when we have to talk to somebody that you never know. You'll never know. Why? Because we do it for you. Because we love you. And we know that you're vulnerable. And we know that some of you are little babes in Christ. And we would rather stand and defend your, your, your salvation just as much as it means ours. That's a watcher. But the end time is going to come when we're all watchers. And sometimes we may have to talk to somebody kind of hard. This is for a watcher. That's responsibility. If they don't have a watcher when the enemy was coming, there was nobody to blow the trumpet. And before they know it, they were, that they were still in bed early in the morning when they start coming and chopping the wood down and breaking the walls. This is what we do. And the watcher, he was the first one to come in contact with the enemy in sight. We also come in contact. We are the first one to come in contact with the enemy. But we do it for you. So that every man that ever lived in this word, they did the same thing. They even had a greater sacrifice than whatever that we can even do today. Praise the Lord. I would like you to turn to the book of First Thessalonians. Chapter 
First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. As a thief in the night is, I don't care how on guard you are, that, that sleep is going to overtake you. That's when the thief comes. When he knows that you're just going to have to you want to stay awake, you'll pass out. Then he will come to steal. That the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, out of all these horrendous things that are going to happen for three and a half years, then they're going to say peace is coming. They're going to be a peacemaker. But that peacemaker is not going to be a peacemaker. It's going to be a, a destruction maker. Peace and safety. There's one man that can pull us out of these things that we're at, that we're on. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them. It is the same thing as a trail upon a woman. Is there any woman here that understands what that means? Did you have a warning a day before that you were going to go to the hospital the next day? When do you know? When the pains start. Today is the day. This is what he's trying to say. Sudden destruction come up upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. No more than the days of Noah that they escape this horrendous rain that cover the water up to the highest mountains for 40 days and 40 nights. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should take you as a surprise. You are all the children of light. That this is, you know, that the trimming of the lamp, this is the light he's talking about. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, put it on the breastplate of faith. It is a time of preparation for the coming of the Lord. And if you don't happen to be here at the coming of the Lord, you're prepared to go into the kingdom of God. This is what the preparation is for. Put it on the breastplate of faith and love. This is, and the faith and love means because at the end, well, all that's going to be here, that be left is you nothing know, but faith and love and hope. That's all going to be. These three things is what's going to, these three ingredients is going to be at the end time, is what's going to be the ingredient in the hearts of, of Christianity. Faith and love. It's not going to be, uh, but uh, you can come to this church, but uh, well, you're a Palestinian, uh, you're an Arab, you can come here. You guys kill one another and your God is Allah. No, if he turned to Christ, he is now your brother. Whatever he come from, he's going to be your brother and he's going to be true love. You've got to have faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God is not appointing us to wrath. There's going to be a tremendous wrath on this earth. But we are not appointed to that wrath. And the prayer that we want to pray is because we don't want to be overtaken in that wrath. But he called us, we were appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. That whether we awake or we are asleep, we should live together with him. Whether we're awake, whether you are alive when he comes, or whether you're dead when he comes. We should live together with him. He tells you here in Thessalonians in the next book, he says, for those that died in Christ shall rise first. And then we, every single one of us that is alive in that day shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So we need to be prepared whether we're going to be dead when he comes 
but we do need to be prepared. And we, we need to be just as prepared if we die before he comes, as prepared as we should be when he comes. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also I know that you do. Praise the Lord. And we comfort one another. Let's live for Jesus. If we have anything to say among ourselves, this is what happened to King David. He says that only if there would be a man, he was a king, that they could come and, and, and knock on my door. On, a, on, a, on the door of the king? And say, let us go to the house of the Lord. King David was waiting for such a time, for such a fellowship. For even somebody that would just knock on his door and say, I'm seeking for the king. Uh, you, you, you want to talk about a, about a diplomatic matter of life and death, but what do you want to see him? I want to invite him into the house of God. And then we'll go tell him, there's somebody that just wants to know if you want to go to the temple. David says, that's the man I'm waiting for. But what is his name? I don't want to know his name. You come invite me to the house of God. This is what he wanted. This is what he, this is what he was, this, is what, this was his joy. This was his love. And this is the way that we should be. We meet another. Let's encourage one another while there is time. Let's sanctify ourselves. Let's live for Jesus. Let's pray. Let's see God. Let's see what God has for us today. Let, 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 before we go out and we're going, let, 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 let's just pray. We'll, let, let, let's see God. Oh, if only there could be somebody, said David, that could invite me into the house of God to talk about the things of God. It is not just for the preacher, but among ourselves. Let's pray. Let's seek God. Let's draw near to God. Why don't we try dedicating our life to God? What do you say? I'm going to be praying for you and you for me. We're going to say, Father, sanctify us and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And let us go forward and meet this day as the sons of God. Father, those who the enemy would like to batter, Father, with his, with his inconsistency, Father, these demons of inconsistency. And, Father, that he would batter them, Father, and would like to crack them open, Father, that they might abandon the way of truth. They never allowed that to happen, Father, to those little ones, my Father. Strengthen them in the name of Jesus, Father, that the words might reach into their very soul, Father, and that they might know that it is thy word, and it was thy Holy Spirit, Father, who has spoken it, Father, and rectify thy word. In the name of Jesus, Father, I ask and I pray, my Father, in his glorious and mighty name. And those, Father, that are in between, Father, strengthen the Father, that might overcome, Father, the evil one, who would like to confuse them, Father, as how to serve you and how to love you, Father. Remove that spirit of confusion from them, Father, and cause them to stand up, Father, and they might be able to see, Father, your throne and your kingdom and, and cause them to start walking forward, Father, in a shortness of step, Father, knowing that they are on the foundation, Father, on the rock, and that they are now sitting with strength and mighty and their legs have been strengthened, Father, that they might be able to move on forward in your holy name, my Father. And for all that are established, Father, I pray that you give them, Father, even more of what they have, Give them more gifts, more strength, more spirit. Baptize them, Father, in a deeper spiritual life. In the glorious name of Jesus, Father, I ask for those, Father. Father, they had stood forward in thy holy name. 
and stood, Father, knowing that you would cause them to stand because they belong to you. And strengthen them even further, Father, that they might even stand, Father, even stronger, Father, for thy holy name and thy Son, Lord Jesus. In them, Father, to all these I pray, Father, and for this church, Father, that you would cause it to become, Father, a mighty and an awesome church, and people that would get up and glorify thy name, that would cause thy, thy countenance to turn and to look at us, Father, that our worship would cause you to stand and take notice, Father, that we have loved you, Father, with all our hearts and all our soul and all our might and all our strength that is within us, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father, I ask and I pray. In the name of my Lord Jesus, Father, who died that I might live, Father, who sacrificed his life, Father, that I might be strengthened in his strength, that I might, that would cause me to know you, Father. In the name of Jesus, Father, in his mighty name, in his wonderful and beautiful name, Father, I ask and I pray all these things, my Father, in the name of Jesus. And now I pray, Father, let thy Holy Spirit cause all these things among us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Glory be thy name, Father, and thy name be exalted by all them that love you. In the name of Jesus, I glorify you, Father, and thank you. Amen, Father, and amen.